Julie, thank you so much for joining us. We are now recording. Um, we are so happy to have you here joining us for Seabert, and I'll turn this over to you and let you do your little chat. Thank you very much, Amanda, and welcome, everybody. I am so excited. This is one of my favorite topics, traumatic brain injury in young children. A little bit about my background. Um, prior to becoming a researcher, I was a clinical speech-language pathologist for many years, um, and in rehab in different settings, early intervention programs, working with adults, diff many different settings. And when I got my PhD, I helped start the rehabilitation research program at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And while working there, I received funding for a federal longitudinal study to study early elementary school outcomes of children who had an injury before age six. And I started coming over to the CDC to talk about that research. And when an opening came up, I applied and I was, I got it. So I've been in CDC for seven years. And one of my interest is still looking at young children in particular, now that I'm in a public health domain, what we, can we do to prevent these injuries? So I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about some of the work we've done at CDC for young children. And then I'm gonna talk about work from my outcome study. Um, and I'm trying to leave time for questions at the end of discussion, because I'd love to hear from all of you as well. And by the way, you'll see my formal name is Juliet on my publications, but my nickname is Julie, just so to avoid confusion with both. Okay, so as we know, injuries occur across the lifespan for children all the time. And what one thing we do know and we've learned through research over the years is that age matters. So children who are injured at a younger age are more at risk for long-term outcomes. And some of this has come from studies from Australia that where they look at boat birth cohorts and they, they are talking about what happens to kids in the long term, particularly Audrey McKinley's work at looking at adult outcomes of early childhood injury. Unfortunately, at CDC, we don't have that kind of longitudinal data. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the report to Congress when I talk about that. But age does matter. And children who have an injury at an early age when everything's are developing are at much more risk for longer term effects. So we do know that the children under five years have the highest number of emergency room visits for TBI. They're more vulnerable to the effects of a global brain injury such as a TBI. A stroke is considered a more isolated localized injury where a TBI is considered a global brain injury. There's been studies, as I mentioned, out of Australia in particular, Vicki Anderson and her group, that talk about that these early injuries have effects on cognition and language that can impact new learning. And if you think of young children at age two, you don't have a lot of what's called cognitive reserve because you're just starting to talk and process what's going on in the world. You haven't learned to read yet. You haven't learned math facts. So younger children have lower rates of cognitive reserve that might help them following this injury. And we also know that the effects of the injury under five may not be obvious till formal school entry. And by that, I mean kindergarten and first grade, which is part of the reason why we applied for this field initiated study through Nidler, um, because we know that children aren't in formal education before they go to kindergarten. They're more, some preschools do offer more uh, formalized learning, but typically that's not done until kindergarten. Now, I love this slide because over the years I've given many talks to Head Start providers, preschool providers, early intervention people, and I show this slide and I say, um, oh, these are outcomes for young children that they have changes in organization, inhibition, memory, behavior regulation. And if I show this slide to preschool teachers, they will tell me, this is my whole class. How do you know what stands out? Um, 
and having raised three boys, I, I would agree with them at this age. So there's a large span of what is considered, quote, in the normal range for kids age three and four for these kinds of behaviors. That's one of the reasons why it's often hard to tell the effects of the injury on children in this age group. So this is a little older data, but it's still true that Emergency department visits are rising for children. Hospitalizations are reduced. So you'll see the blue bar is from 2007. The orange is from 2013 data. And so deaths are being reduced and hospitalizations, which is an indicator of a more severe injury, are being reduced. Um, but we still see a high number of them. And this, this is really true um, for the 2010 data, but even in our more recent ones, which is why I kept this slide. Children age zero to four years have the highest rate of emergency department visits for brain injury. Now our current data shows that seniors age 65 years and older are top, so they're higher than zero to four years. But in children, that's still the highest rate of emergency department visits. And that is a lot uh, to swallow, that those kids all are getting injured at that young age. A few years ago, I did a project with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where we looked at their, it's a large pediatric healthcare system that has an integrated EHR. So we were able to see where patients were entering the system. Was it primary care, ED care? especially outpatient like concussion clinics or sports medicine clinics and inpatient. Um, and as you can see from this, one striking thing we learned is that children with concussions or mild TBI were mostly seeing their primary care physician for care, 82%. However, in this same paper, we also show that ages zero to four are more likely to go to um, the emergency department or urgent care. Oh, and, and I just saw a question. I'm going to stop a minute. I, did, I would love to share these slides with you. However, they would have to be cleared by CDC, and they are not. So I will post something afterwards to share. I apologize for that. That's something that I have to work with in, in working in my government position. So these exact slides will not be able to be uploaded. Thank you. So this is another paper we wrote on that CHOP data because while sports has really brought brain injuries to the forefront in the public, we, we're thankful for that, it's not the only mechanism of injury in children. And as you can see, um, sports and recreational injuries really don't start till children get into organized sports, which start, can start in preschool but really starts between ages 6 and 10 and really peaks in adolescence. So there were more, approximately 30% of concussions were non-sports related overall, but there were higher proportions for younger children, which makes sense. Younger children are more likely to, to experience their brain injury because of falls. And this is a paper that I wrote looking at something called the National Survey of Children's Health where parents are asked questions, did your child have any of these health conditions like um, diabetes, learning disability, trauma? They ask about a brain injury that was diagnosed by a physician. So parents who report in this study had to um, be seen by a physician. And the reason I put this slide up is there's a large amount of estimates by parent report of children who have a lifetime of history of TBI in the US, but also with that, there's a list of health conditions that, that are more aligned with those parents who said yes to those questions. So yes, there is a lifetime history of TBI compared to those who said no, there's not a lifetime history. So you see particularly some things like developmental delay, speech and language problems, um, ADHD are very high in those children, the very highly associated with TBI. And again, we're so thrilled about the impact of what sports laws and sports has played on influencing care for children. I think it's brought it much more to the forefront, so we thank them.
However, how do young children experience a TBI? How do they get their TBI? Um, coming to CDC, I was very interested in this. So I started a study with my colleagues here and also um, two interns who, um, Caitlin Law and um, Michael Joseph, they, we looked at 39,000 narratives about what causes a fall in children ages zero to four because they're more vulnerable. There's very limited literature talking about how these kids fall and the circumstances. And this gave us an opportunity to provide a national estimate. So on your left, you'll see narrative examples. So this is what we reviewed. Um, we looked at these narratives and said, okay, what kind, they were coded for action. So you see in the first one, nine month old was sitting in a shopping cart, rolled out of car seat, fell from shopping cart and hit ground. So the action rolled kind of started this. Okay, whereas in the second one, they really fell to the floor after being pulled by their brother. So they were pulled by their brother and then fell. The third one is a patient was running trips and fell hitting head on coffee table. So we looked at these and coded them. And we also looked at product codes. What products are associated with falls in children? Um, when we were looking at the methods, we weighted the cases. We did a John Point regression analysis to look at trends over time and, comp and calculate a confidence interval. So our results show a large number of children ages four years and younger, and that's what's in the data, we're emergency room data, were treated annually, and they increased significantly over time. Most are treated and released to home, and child actions such as running accounted for the greatest proportion of injuries. However, actions by others were highest for children younger than age one, which makes sense because they're just starting to move around in their environment. And the majority of falls occurred in the home. So what was interesting from this is this is the first paper out of CDC that we really looked in addition to internal injury to the head and concussions, what were coded as fractured skulls. That's a more serious injury and very, it's much smaller as you can see, most of these were coded either as concussions or internal injury to the head. Most of them in this age group were males, not surprisingly. Um, and most of them were in children ages one year or younger, which means as I mentioned before, somehow adult actions were more related. So. What we learned about child actions falls for all ages. Some of the narratives simply said the child fell on the floor. Um, but less than one year, we saw things like roll as indicated or climbing. That's a time when children are just starting to acquire developmental milestones. Three to four years, we're seeing kids jumping, tripping, and running. That makes sense if you think about them developmentally. But actions by others were highest for less than one year old. And it was primarily dropped. Kids were being dropped, meaning they were held in car seats and dropped. They may have been um, carried somewhere and dropped. Greater than two years, they were carried, placed on a surface where they fell off of or pushed. And three to four year olds, which makes sense, they were pushed, carried, or pulled. And so, Here's all the products related to it. As you can see, there's a lot of furniture products, beds, um, baby furniture. And as children get older, you see sports and rec start to come into the picture um, as one of the leading products, meaning that it doesn't always mean they were playing these sports. They might have been in their homes in, in their parents' um, gym area, and they were on a running machine or something like that. So we know these children are at highest risk. They have the highest rate. What can we do to prevent them? Well, one is environmental modifications, such as modifications of physical space. Like you see that young man looking at the fence on stairs, the gates on stairs, and also improved parental supervision approaches in the home, such as, you know, how do you carry your baby? Do you make sure that they're secure when you do that? Um, Here's some limitations from the study that we're not able to um, really talk about. It underestimates the burden. 
causes and circumstances may vary by community and location because of differences in home and community environment. And they're captured from healthcare provider notes. So there may be some omissions and inaccuracy. But this is something we really want to address. And I'm currently working on a second paper looking at those fractured skulls and how children fell hard enough to get fractured skulls to see if we can come up with some prevention messages. Okay, so that's about prevention. Now I just want to mention our report to Congress on the management of traumatic brain injury in children. This was mandated to us um, and we started this after this paper. This paper was published in 2016 online where a group of us is, you can see it's multidisciplinary, physicians, um, educational people. I think Debbie was from Seabird at the time. We looked at what are the health, the service delivery systems the parents navigate following traumatic brain injury, and it is healthcare and educational symptoms. And that paper was very helpful in our report to Congress that identified gaps in healthcare, school, and community services highlights policy strategies could, that could address short and long-term consequences of TBI, and offers specific and actionable recommendations to improve TBI care in children and also advance our understanding of what happens to children following TBI. So this report was mandated in 2014 by Congress. It actually asked us to do a systematic review in collaboration with Health and Human Services. And it was released in March of 2018. And just a little note about the process. I mean, we had over 50 external reviewers from different aspects, including Head Start, um, who looked at our contact at the beginning, looked at our outline, looked at our first review, and then the final one and provided us feedback. Um, one of the things we learned in this report, and we talk about deep inside the report, there's one section on preschool children. And what we talk about is when they leave the healthcare setting, they do not have a single point of entry for services because they're not in formalized school yet. So they get a TBI diagnosis, some return to preschool, some return to Head Start, um, some may go to daycare setting. Um, and the potential sources of care following this are the pediatrician or family physician. But these community settings are all over. There, there's not one single point of entry um, for kids. And also, we noted that the link between the medical community and school for all children is better if children are enrolled in inpatient rehab, as a study by Ann Glang et al. talked about. But there's such variability across the country as, in terms of if school intervention coordinators are available, medical records are not always easily accessible by the school. This is true for preschools. And the injury may not be reported to school, especially if it's mild. So even in preschool, kids, this may happen at home, and parents may not tell the school about it. And return to play and activity for children, as you know, there's return to play legislation in 50 states that focuses on organized sport. And there's also consensus guidelines for return to sport. But there's very little out there about returning to activities such as gym class, particularly for young kids. There's nothing for kids under five who should they play on the playground after they have this concussion? What should they do? That's lacking. We also make a point to say, in this report that there are very, very few studies of long-term outcomes of TBI following a childhood TBI. So we do know from some of the work that's done that there's low rates of enrollment in post-secondary education, employment and independent living. And also we do know there's a high rate of self-reported childhood brain injury in the justice system. Um, those aren't outcomes we really wanna we want to see the kids have more positive outcomes. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of studies that I know of, or any that I know of, that report on what the successful outcome, even for kids who had an injury at age four. So we don't know a lot about that yet. So 
here's some recommendations that we made in the report to Congress about returning to school. Training and coordination is important. It's important to think about the transitions that children experience throughout their lifespan and really a need for more longitudinal studies and comprehensive surveillance estimates to better understand this problem. Um, and these three words, recognize, monitor, and care, are three main messages about this report, about what's needed for children. And I, I will say there's a, a think tank brain injury conference called the Galveston Brain Injury Conference. And last year and this year, it's been dedicated to pediatric TBI, and we focused on these three areas, including across the lifespan in young children. So hopefully there'll be some products and messaging out of there that can expand the work in this area. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about outcomes. And this research is done, I'm gonna talk about the studies out of my uh, NIDER longitudinal study called Language and Literacy Outcomes of Preschool Children with TBI. So what the, one of the reasons we got this is we, we included a graph that showed the number of emergency department visits, which was in the 10,000 over five years for children, young children, compared to who's enrolled in special education. And those numbers range from five to 10 over five years for preschool from the um, Department of Ed report. I think that really helped us get this because we know that, you know, we don't know much about this age group and what their outcomes are. So one of the things we wanted to do in this study is understand academic and behavioral outcomes. We also had a control group of children with orthopedic injuries, and we wanted to examine service utilization patterns, both in medical and service delivery for this age group. So we asked parents at the first study visit to tell us about what services they access after their diagnosis. So children in this study were between the ages of six to nine years old. They had a history of traumatic brain injury for age six. And the reason we moved up from age five was that we wanted kids who had not started school yet and were at least a year post injury. And we were learning that kids might be five years, 10 months and not in kindergarten yet. And this was a study that was very difficult to, um, recruitment was, was challenging. So, we extended to before age six, they had not been in formal school yet. Um, what was interesting is 81% of our cohort was mild. That, that surprised us. We thought we would get families with more severe injuries. And many of the parents told us they approached us because they noticed differences in their children's behavior after the injury, and they were having trouble getting professionals to listen to them or know where to refer them to. Um, we also had a control group of children the same age who experienced orthopedic injury. And so we saw them for three time points, one visit annually. That was part of the reason why some parents didn't want to participate because we did three hour testing sessions. I'm going to talk to you first on the participants for year one um, and dis discuss group differences. So this is a paper we had published in. Journal of Head Trauma Rehab in 2018, where we talk about early elementary school outcomes in children with TBI. And what was interesting about this study is, A, they were primarily mild or mild complicated, meaning they had a mild injury on the Glasgow Coma Scale, but they had imaging findings. And 61% of our kids in the mild category, or 63 in this paper that we looked at, um, were mild complicated. So they had imaging findings at the time. What we learned was all children scored within the range of age expectations on our measures. And working with two psychologists who are very statistically oriented, they were very, very worried about how we could talk about this data when everybody was scoring within the average range, or most of the kids were, um, in both groups. But we started looking at group differences. So even, even though children were scoring within the average range, 
we notice group differences on more complex measures, such as pragmatic language. And on that test, instead of asking them to name something, we would say, what would you say to your grandmother if she asked you to come to her house? So you posed a situation to the child and they would have to respond, which requires more formulation and thinking, reading comprehension. And again, in young children, even on the Woodcock-Johnson, the reading comprehension is like a sentence. It's not very much information, but children were showing group differences. Verbal fluency, storytelling, and executive functions measured by parent report and adaptive behavior. So these are areas that we saw group differences, but children weren't necessarily in the clinical range. And if you see this table, one of the things we did was look at the percent of children in the clinical range, and we defined that as more than two standard deviations or below the mean in, in this group, because that's often what helps them get services at school, right? They have to be lower than the mean. And as you can see, not very many kids are in that range. Some of the higher ones are story retail, pragmatic language, um, reading comprehension, executive functions, definitely high and adaptive behavior. So parents are noticing things that are different about these kids. Um, and some of these measures, such as pragmatic language or story retail, aren't traditionally done as part of a school assessment. Um, and so one of the things a few other things we learned from this study is high rate of hearing screen failure. That surprised us. And parents were telling us things like, oh, they fail that all the time. And we learned that many of these children had not had their hearing even screened after the injury, or they were being screened in the pediatrician's office. And if they failed, they weren't referred to further testing, according to the parents. Um, it may be that this was the state of Georgia. I don't know. We also learned that children experience headaches long after the injury. And one of the physicians on our advisory board suggested we start asking about health conditions. And we're like, really? But then when we asked, I think it was a rate of between four and 10% in the TBI group compared to a lower rate in the orthopedic group. And if you look at like national surveillance of ch children's headaches in ages six to nine, it's less than 1%. So these kids were still having headaches after the injury. And we also noticed, so the index injury was the injury that got them in the study. But in examining medical records, our research assistants noticed some parents had been back to the emergency room a few more times that they didn't tell us in the interview, but they saw it in the record. So, as I say overall, children start their concussion and brain injury history before age five, before they even get into sports. We also looked at services for preschool children. As I mentioned in the report to Congress, we identified that there's no single point of entry. But what we learned from our study is nobody received inpatient rehabilitation or early intervention services. Some of the parents were referred to early intervention services by whoever evaluated them for their brain injury. But in Georgia, they administer something called the ages and stages questionnaire. So if you pass that, you are not seen for early intervention services. And a couple of the parents told us their children passed that because right after the injury, they weren't showing delays. Parents noticed their behavior was different but that wasn't something that could be accounted for in the screening method. Only 26 received outpatient treatment and all were in regular preschool. There were no special education placements. Now, looking at how these children tested, that makes sense because not very many were below um, the second standard deviation. They, they probably aren't qualifying for services at this young age. But now I wanna take you to a second study we did where we looked at um, how is pragmatic language related to adaptive behavior? And Kathy Hendricks, who's the lead author on this, she was a research assistant at the time. She's now finishing her doctorate in developmental psychology. Um, and she 
um, came up with this idea and did all the analysis. So we know that language skills are very important for social functioning and that pragmatic language is a more complex skill that not only requires language, but it requires you integrating and using it to achieve to school, and it's more linked to cognition. Uh, and in some studies have shown that basic language skills like expressive language, expressive vocabulary, grammar, can re remain intact after TBI. If you look at executive skills, it develops across childhood um, starting early on, but then it continues up to age 20 to 25. Um, those of you who are parents of sons can understand that, I, I think, as I can. But executive functioning predicts later adaptive outcomes, and it also predicts later social adaptive outcomes in children, regardless of um, whether you're injured or not. It's a very good predictor. In looking at adaptive functioning, and the measure we use has these three domains on it, um, conceptual adaptive functioning, which is language use and literacy, social adaptive functioning, which is interpersonal skills, and practical adaptive functioning, which is hygiene and safety skills. Um, and those are the three that I'll talk about in this study, you'll see. So we wanted to look in further into outcomes into adaptive behavior. So what Cassie did is she looked in the study and we picked two groups who were approximately age eight years old. So we had 36 TBI children and 40 orthopedic controls. Um, and we excluded those outliers who had lower, so more severe injuries and more severe um, conceptual and practical adaptive functioning. We did a sensitivity analysis that showed no difference. And children included, again, were primarily mild complicated. So they had a mild injury, but they had imaging findings. And these are the measures that we used for this study. We, we did for all children um, an, an IQ, um, Glasgow Coma Scale for language. We looked at expressive vocabulary and pragmatic language. For executive functioning, we looked at the brief global T-score. And for adaptive functioning, we used the Parent Report Adaptive Behavior Assessment System, where we looked at those three domains, practical, social, and conceptual. And then we looked, we did sensitivity tests. We used standardized scores for all the analysis. Um, Kathy first ran a series of ANOVAs to test our primary aims, but then she did something called bootstrapping. I'm not going to go into what all that does, but it incorporates indirect effects, and it's a much more complicated statistical procedure, which allows you to more look uh, more closely at relationships. So what we learned from this study is that the TBI group had significantly lower scores compared to the orthopedic group on all age eight outcome measures, except for practical adaptive functioning. So that's the one that's just like safety and hygiene. Um, performance on the measures in both groups was mostly, again, in the average range re relative to normative data. These between group differences in pragmatic language and social adaptive functioning persisted at the age nine visit, so a year later. And at age nine, TBI participants showed lower conceptual abilities. So what does this mean? So language, expressive language at age eight did not predict any aspect of adaptive functioning. So how children were using their vocabulary, their, their, their vocabulary abilities didn't predict. The pragmatic language did. At age eight, it predicted 11% of the variance in adaptive functioning at age nine, over and above injury type and any of the other covariates, and having a TBI predicted reduced um, pragmatic language. Pragmatic language was a significant mediator in the relationship between um, uh, adaptive behavior. So executive functioning, it predicted adaptive functioning for social and conceptual, but not practical. But 
there was an indirect of injury type, that it was not significant for any age of nine adaptive score, suggesting that it doesn't mediate the relationship like pragmatic language does. And we didn't see a bi-directional relationship with adaptive behavior, meaning adaptive behavior at age nine did not go back and look at pragmatic language. So the points of this study are that early TBI may interfere with pragmatic language development or more complex language development into this middle childhood time in elementary school. And it may affect the ongoing development of conceptual and social adaptation skills, but it's not explained by expressive vocabulary. So it's really the more complex language skills that rely on organization of language and cognitive skills to respond to social situations that are vulnerable to the effects of early TBI. And so in school-age children who experience TBI in the midst of language development, this aligns with previous literature from Ryan et al., even in mild to mild complicated. So there is some literature coming out of Australia again that talks about this as a possibility. Um, because social adaptive functioning really relies on language expression and social communication. And its conceptual functioning relies on higher order integration of communication, planning, and self-direction. So um, executive functioning wasn't the main mediator. That, that's what we found surprising about this study. It was really the language. And, other contributing variables that we wonder complicate this is we did a laboratory-based language assessment of pragmatic. Do we really capture the issue? And we didn't have data on um, maternal education. We didn't talk about that as much. So the point from this study is even children who have mild complicated injuries can have a lasting impact on their adaptive and complex language development. So what are some interventions we can do? One is pragmatic language assessment of children who have experienced a brain injury and also intervention. Um, and we need to do further longitudinal studies. So I want to mention this because, again, this is a paper that I published that shows speech and language problems. It's one of the first to show that there are speech and language problems related to a history of traumatic brain but also pragmatic inter intervention in school is something that speech language pathologists could do. Now, recognizing that most of our children scored in the average range on these measures, our research staff developed a one pager to give to our families with suggestions for parents to facilitate social participation. So as you can see, we talk about we, we not only researched the literature, we interviewed some families um, in our neighborhoods and asked, what do parents do to get their children involved? So you can see this is something that we gave to parents because we were concerned that we're seeing these findings, but they may not qualify for services at school or in community settings. The next study I want to talk about is hearing screening. Um, following traumatic brain injury in young children. Um, yes, I am able to share those handouts with you. I will do that. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background on TBI and hearing loss, because if you look at the anatomy of the ear, the nerve of hearing is housed in the hard bony skull, as is the middle ear, the whole ear. So anything shaking up to the skull could potentially impact function of the ear. And a lot of reports talk about temporal bone fractures, which is the area of bone right around the ear. There, there is research saying that these fractures can lead to not only injury to the facial nerve and nerve of hearing, but hearing loss. And as we know, early hearing recognition of hearing loss, especially in children, is imperative and can greatly decrease um, issues later on. So what we did is, of the parents of participants who attended a testing session. Each testing session, we did vision, hearing, and articulation screening. And interestingly, not a lot of research studies on kids do hearing screening. Um, 
And my colleague, who's a neuropsychologist, at first balked at this, and then once we did it and we saw what happened, now she uses it in all her studies of children. So when you read about children's outcome studies, check to see if they check their hearing or screen for it. And we were surprised at the number who were failing the hearing screen, so we developed a one-pager um, that parents could take to their pediatrician that said, they failed this hearing screening, we're suggesting that they have a complete audiometric assessment because they've had a brain injury. Even for, I think we worded, we worded it, we suggested the audiologic assessment because we were learning that even children in the orthopedic group were failing the testing as well. <coughs> so not only did we have children with TBI who failed the hearing screening, we had children with orthopedic injuries which makes sense in this age range because the hearing screen can also be related to other factors such as um, ear infection. So, um, Akila Heggs led this study. She was, she's an audiologist who was getting her PhD in public health, perfect. So she conducted an interview with parents who were interested in participating and then we looked at trends on what happened after the hearing screening. So. That's our rate of hearing screening failure in each group, higher in TBI. Some participants failed the hearing screening at multiple time points in our assessment. Children in the TBI group, 80% um, had a mild TBI. Most were mild complicated. 40% of the parents reported they did not understand the hearing screening results. Um, we had parents report their children failed the hearing screening several times. This one parent in particular said she was never referred. And 50% of the parents reported they did not follow up with their pediatrician. So it's not just at the doctor's office, it's also parents aren't following up in part because they may not understand what this means. 20% um, of the parents reported their child had some severe problem. And we had one child return to the second study visit with hearing aids and a diagnosis of severe sensory neural hearing loss. Interestingly, this child was being evaluated at school for an autism diagnosis. Uh, oh, yeah, I tried to get onto this oh. webinar and I couldn't. Okay. It's the TBI oh. for preschool, and they were talking so about um, what my point about hearing this hearing study. And, and, yeah. Yeah, um, they they said they're going to be able to have it through CBI um, in a hey, few excuse days. Excuse me, somebody's oh, like phone that. is not muted. Could you mute your phone? Thank you. Um, so children following TBI have a risk for hearing loss, and they our findings align with other studies. And parents need to be educated, and children need to be screened. And if they fail the screening, they really need to be seen for audiometric testing. And so for preschool children, hearing screening is offered as part of a well child visit at the pediatrician, but children's hearing is not systematically screened in either clinical settings or research studies following TBI. And changes in hearing are not always readily observable. Um, the child just may seem quiet and maybe parents think that's their personality. Or in the case of the child who came back to our study with hearing aids, her caregivers thought that's just her. She just doesn't respond much. Um, and parents may also notice issues with hearing and ears and not know where to go for assessment. So again, what should we do for this? We created this one pager, which I can share with you, that talks about hearing loss and brain injury. It gives parents what should, what should I do? And if it goes undetective, what it means. Because we really want to make sure the kids get their hearing checked after TBI. And we really want to make sure in taking care of young children that their school performance is monitored and that parents need to let your doctor and school know when you have concerns. Um, this is my research team for this study and the funding source for it. Um, and now I'm going to leave some time for questions and discussion because I'd like to hear from all of you either about your experiences or if you have any questions on the information I present.
Thank you, Julie. It's Amanda. Um, so for those of you who have questions for her, please make sure to use your chat box on your right hand side. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I have a question for the group. How many people are preschool teachers or are you elementary school teachers? What what are your um how do you interact with children, I guess is my question. Or maybe healthcare professionals. Oh, district nurses, great. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. So I'm wondering, we have a range. Great. So some of you work in preschool, some of you are in K-12. Um, I guess my first question is, of those of you in K-12, how many of you ever hear that someone's had a brain injury before they start school and that's accounting for what you're seeing in school? Has anyone ever experienced that? Only one. I guess we can unmute, should we unmute? Um, microphones, Amanda, so that or phone so folks can chat, or is the chat box the best option? I think probably chat box because if we get this many people talking all at once, it's going to be tough. I did see a couple okay. of questions kind of in the middle, so I was okay. going to go back to those if that works for you. Sure, okay. Um, so I'm pulling here's one from Anna Morehouse. And she said, <laughs> just went away. Um, do you think some children are being misdiagnosed with ASD when in fact it's TBI? Yes, we saw that in action on the study. We saw a young child, she had a, a hearing loss and actually she had a fractured skull in her temporal lobe, um, which we think really caused the severity of her loss. Um, we had two parents in our study tell us that their pediatrician sent them to an autism center because they thought they did the best testing for what the parents were concerned about. And these parents were reporting behavioral differences. So I'm sure that happens. I also, in a recent meeting where I talked about this study, was told by a few people, I forget what state they were from, that they often categories children with TBI as having autism because they can get them services. So yes, I have heard of that. I'm not sure, it's not been tested whether that's a good thing to do. I think sometimes well-meaning educational professionals are just trying to get kids served. And as you can see from what I reported, children may not qualify, for example, for a TBI special ed category if they're not scoring well below the mean on mm -hmm. test. So hopefully that helps. And then another more, question. Yeah, I've got a few more questions in here. Um, have one from Nora Knock. Just can you give specific questions to help trigger parents to recall specific falls or injuries? Oh, that's a great question. That varies from survey to survey, um, which is um, I think some folks ask, has your child ever hit their head that you had to take them to the doctor? I think some folks ask, have you ever had a traumatic brain injury? Um, I think ones that ask more detail about the symptoms or um, there's a screening measure by the state of Nebraska that asks that specifically list symptoms for children zero to five. And I think I can share that too, because um, I pulled it off their website. We used it in our study to screen our orthopedic controls to make sure they had not experienced a brain injury prior to their entering the study. And we continued it each year to make sure they weren't having brain injuries that would contribute to their, um, their um, performance. So yeah, I can share that with you too. 
Yeah, it looks like that would be appreciated. Um, so another question is from Lori Jire. And going back to it, she said, for very young children who have had TBIs but don't qualify for early intervention, what would be the best way to keep in touch with families? Would we be best off to establish eligibility based on medical statements if possible so we can follow up? That's fair. That's a great question. All of these are great questions, but that what's interesting about that one is I talked to someone from the state of Ohio who told me that they didn't at the time, this was at the time of our study, they didn't use ages and stages because some children with specific health conditions passed it as with TBI. And so technically in some states, just having a new onset medical diagnosis will help you at least be evaluated. And early on when I was in rehab and a practicing clinician, if all you needed, even for the TBI category at school, was documentation of the injury as a medical condition. Now most um, school systems and states have in there and impact on educational functioning to qualify for TBI. But I think some states, you, you'd have to inquire about eligibility requirements for your particular local area for early intervention, because it may just be that your state just allows for medical documentation. Thank you. And looks like Janet Cameron wants to know how to get access to the handout and documents that you mentioned. Um, um, I can share those with you. I'll, okay. I'll, Amanda can post them, right? Yeah, and I'll just send them out to the group afterwards when we also will okay. have um, an eval and certificate and those things available at the end. Um, and then Tiffany Hall wants to know if you recommend any particular testing for pragmatic language under the age of six for standardized scores. Well, and we use the subset, the subtest from the castle. And interestingly, when I was writing up the proposal for the grant, I asked a friend, Keith Yates, who's a neuropsychologist, very well known. He suggested using the pragmatic language test on the castle because they found it sensitive and so did we even for very young children. And we had trouble finding, um, we tried to do some child testing in executive functions and the tests just were not sensitive to this age group because of the wide range and the fact that most of our kids were testing in the normal limits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, and then Lois Hawkins asked, what about long-term accommodation during school to end of high school and possibly college? Oh boy. You know, as you know, if you work in the schools, each year eligibility is reviewed and determined. And I think what I, from what I've seen with these young kids, they may not qualify for services early on, but then as they get older, they may qualify. And then sometimes the brain injury isn't considered as the source of why they're having trouble, it's forgotten. That, that's what I've heard from the field. Um, we are looking into what's happening in this transition to adulthood. There's not a lot out there on brain injury at all, especially for kids who had it at a younger age, what were they like older? I think Sherry Wade's group and the Australia group are the places that have the best um, research on that, but it's still not following kids from the time of injury up until adulthood at age 18 or 20. Yeah. So we need more research on that. Yeah. And then it looks like the last question I haven't gotten to yet is from Alina West, and she wants to know, are any of the patients with hearing loss being reported as speaking louder? Ooh. That's a good question. We didn't ask, we asked what parents noticed. I didn't see that in our data, but I'm sure that happened. Um, in the case of the young lady who was fitted with hearing aid, she was just very quiet and not socially interactive. Mm -hmm. But she had a pretty severe hearing loss. That would explain that she wasn't really hearing much. Um, but someone who has a more mild loss, or for example, when I presented on that paper at different conferences, interestingly, I've had parents come up to me 
and tell me they experienced that. They found out like six months later, their child had a hearing loss from the injury. And then I had a couple physicians at different places tell me kids can have their um, ossicular chain broken, like if they have an impact to the side of the head, and nobody thinks to examine that. Um, and that would be a conductive hearing loss because that's what conducts the sound. That would be kind of like having an ear infection if that's broken. So there's many, di I'm hearing a lot of stories. We need to do more research to show what's really happening. Our study is a very small end, but I'm hoping that it gets accepted where we submitted it so it gets the message out. Yeah. Well, Julie, thank you so much. I think that probably comments would continue to come in, but I know we're short on time. Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to answer all of these questions and listen to these comments and stories and um, your presentation and what you, the work you've been doing is just phenomenal. So thank you so oh, much you. for your time. We do appreciate it. Well, I appreciate hearing about all the teachers, what, what everybody's experienced and interest in this too. So thank you. All right. Well, if folks, thank you all so much for joining us. This was recorded today. I'm actually going to be stopping recording here.